What is it that makes someone a legend? What is it about their lives that catapults the rare few to greatness? It's difficult to say, but in all of history, there is only a handful of truly great figures, and none was greater than Napoleon Bonaparte. This is the tomb of the most famous ruler in the world, one of the most interesting and complex men who ever lived, and one of my favorite people. Napoleon Bonaparte's buried in there. There are more books written about Napoleon than any other man in history. But you don't get to be that famous just by being a great general. He was a genius, interested in everything. Art, literature, mathematics. You know our system of numbering houses? Odd numbers on one side of the street, even on the other? That was Napoleon's idea. But in spite of his fame, there's a mystery year in his life that practically no one knows about. But it's when a young general became Napoleon the Great. It was a year that changed the world. Our story begins 200 years ago in Egypt. a land virtually unknown to Europeans of that time. This was a country that had lost touch with its glorious past. Its vast temples and monuments shrouded in mystery. Its ancient writings, indecipherable. The Egypt of Napoleon's day was an Islamic country. The skyline of its capital, Cairo, filled with the mosques and minarets of the faithful. Bonaparte was only 29 and had just amazed the world with his military victories in Italy. He intended to establish his fame and glory by conquering Egypt. But why Egypt? Well, France was at war with Britain, and by conquering Egypt, Napoleon would block the trade routes to Britain's most valuable possession, India. There was another motive as well. Bonaparte was hungry for a new challenge. Europe, he wrote, is a molehill. Everything wears out. My glory is already past, and this tiny Europe does not offer enough of it. We must go to the east. All great glory has always been gained there. Seeking fame and glory, Napoleon would follow in the footsteps of his hero, Alexander the Great. He would sail for Egypt, that exotic land that for centuries had remained isolated from the Western world. After weeks at sea, the French landed near Alexandria, then a sleepy seaport, and they captured the city with little resistance. The country wasn't even ruled by Egyptians but by Mameluk warriors who had seized control of Egypt. In the 13th century, the Egyptian Sultan bought 12,000 young slave boys, Mamelukes, from the Caucasus Mountains near Armenia and trained them for an elite fighting corps. The Mamelukes soon overthrew the Sultan and had ruled from Cairo ever since. Soon, Bonaparte would have to fight them, but that was easier said than done. This is the Egyptian desert. It's hot, very hot. Goes up to 130 degrees in summer. Tourists are advised to wear a hat, light clothing, and drink a quart of water every hour. Bonaparte arrived in July. His men had heavy woolen uniforms and no water bottles. Why? Because Bonaparte was an amazing contradiction. He could manage minute details of his campaign, was a great strategist, but when he wanted something, he just wanted it. And now he wanted Cairo, which was 130 miles away. So he took his army, marched them through the desert with no accurate map, inadequate supplies, and hardly any water. Napoleon was economical with almost everything, except the lives of his men. <laughs> 
As they marched across the desert, the heat was unbearable, and the troops began to strip off their uniforms. Crazed by the heat and lack of water, many dumped their rations. Who could eat dry biscuits when dying of thirst? The dust parched their throats, and the sand burned their feet as the soldiers marched toward Cairo. To add to their misery, lakes and ponds shimmered on the distant horizon when none were there. The soldiers called them mirages, literally visions. Tormented by the prospect of water, only to find it was an illusion, some men lost their wits and committed suicide. When wells were found, they were emptied in minutes. Sergeant Francois wrote, more than 30 soldiers died by those wells. When the soldiers finally reached the Nile, they broke ranks and threw themselves into the water. Some jumped in with their clothes and weapons, floating and swimming for hours, drinking as much as they could. Then they gorged themselves with watermelons from nearby fields. By the time they reached Cairo, many had dysentery. It was three weeks since the army left the Egyptian coast, and now they prepared for battle. The Mameluk battle line was drawn about a mile from the French. Behind them loomed the Great Pyramids. To the left, the mosques glittered on the skyline of Cairo. At 2 p.m., during the worst heat of the day, the French army prepared to engage the Mameluks. The Mameluks were no ordinary cavalrymen. An elite and proud fighting corps, they were unafraid of death. They believed they would go straight to paradise if they died in battle. Their tombs were large and elaborate. Bonaparte ordered his divisions to arrange themselves into the well-known square formation. Rifles at the outside, baggage and cavalry inside, and the artillery at the outer corners. The Battle of the Pyramids was unlike any other. For the first time in history, a European professional army would clash with the elite Oriental fighting class. It could have been billed as East meets West. The Mameluks were fresh and confident. Their costumes were exotic, armed with daggers, rifles, battle axes and pistols. The Mameluks were a formidable sight. Napoleon always knew how to inspire his men. Pointing to the pyramids, he shouted, Soldiers, 40 centuries look down upon us. The Mameluk cavalry charged the French squares. The disciplined French troops waited until the Mameluks were almost upon them and met the charge with devastating firepower. The attack was repeated again with the same result. Mameluk corpses littered the battlefield. To the victor belongs the spoils, and the French were determined to collect. From the fallen Mamelukes, they stripped the jewels, gold, silver, and gathered up the fine weapons. This was their reward for all their suffering. Things were looking up. Bonaparte had conquered Egypt. Let me tell you a neat detail about the Battle of the Pyramids. It was fought here, at Mbaba in a melon patch. The pyramids are over there. Look at them. They're miles away. You see, Napoleon was concerned about how he'd go down in history. So he always gave his battles dramatic names. Battle of Mbaba? Not so catchy. Battle of the Melon Patch? That's worse. So history knows it as the Battle of the Pyramids. Bonaparte had captured Cairo, and his officers happily moved into the palaces vacated by the retreating Mamelukes, sometimes even inheriting their harems. But in a sense, the Cairo of 200 years ago was two cities. There was the Cairo of the masses, teeming with bustling bazaars that offered exotic products of every kind, from frankincense and myrrh to fezes. Craftsmen made baskets, rugs, pottery, the French soldiers were fascinated by the covered markets and traded buttons from their uniforms for goods. Besides the strange and wonderful wares of the bazaar, there was the exotic slave market, where for a month's wages, 
you could buy a slave girl. Then there was the glorious Cairo of the Mamelukes, whose mysterious palaces were full of hidden rooms. Where cloistered ladies of the harem peered from behind screens, watching the men talking and eating. The Mamelukes lived in great luxury, with mosaic floors and staircases of marble, alabaster, polished granite. There was a bath on every floor and windows with glass panes. Bonaparte occupied the house of one of the Mamelukes who had fled Cairo. But it wasn't all palaces and luxury. Napoleon had to deal with the fact that Egyptians, rich or poor, were bound together by one thing, a consuming devotion to their religion, Islam. So Bonaparte, being a practical man, announced, I am not Christian, and my army and I want to become Muslims. It's really pretty wild stuff. It's as if the President of the United States had arrived in Cairo and announced that he and his entire entourage was converting to Islam. It's incredible. But you know, you have to remember, Napoleon has just been through the French Revolution. He's really a radical. And he's saying things that no other general on the planet would say. There was a small problem with conversion, however. Muslims do not drink alcohol, and the males are all circumcised. Two prospects that held little appeal for the French soldier. As the army settled in Cairo, Bonaparte must have been pleased. He had just vanquished the Mamelukes and was master of Egypt. But then disaster struck. Napoleon had defeated the Mamelukes and taken possession of Egypt. But his luck was about to change. In this bay at Aboukir, on Egypt's Mediterranean coastline, Napoleon came face to face with disaster. You see, he wasn't alone. The British fleet, commanded by England's greatest admiral, Horatio Nelson, had been searching for their French enemy. And at Aboukir, they finally cornered their prey. The French admiral had wanted to sail his warships to a safer anchorage. But Napoleon insisted they stay in the Egyptian waters. It was a decision that was going to cost him. That's because Aboukir Bay is an admiral's nightmare. An unprotected shallow bay that today is only used by fishermen who wouldn't dream of mooring overnight, let alone anchor there for a month. The French admiral, Brie, anchored his fleet as close to the coast as he dared and aimed all his cannons seaward in case Nelson found them, which is exactly what happened. At two o'clock on the afternoon of August 1st, Nelson spotted the entire French fleet at Aboukir Bay. If he waited for his fleet to catch up to him, it would be six o'clock before he attacked. With only a couple of hours of daylight remaining, Nelson decided to fight the most spontaneous naval battle in history. The French expected the British to fight in the accepted way, to wait until daybreak and then sail their ships opposite the French and fire away until one surrendered. But Nelson threw the rule book away and sailed straight into the attack. As the British ships neared the French line, they saw that they could slip between the shore and the anchored French ships. Never expecting to be attacked from the shore, the French had no guns facing in that direction, and the battle became a rout. As the battle raged through the night, the roar of cannons and screams of the wounded and dying filled the air. The Lorient, the largest ship in the world with 120 cannons, was about to perish. She was on fire and having been freshly painted was highly flammable. When the fire reached her store of gunpowder, she exploded with a roar that could be heard 50 miles away. It was undoubtedly the loudest sound they had ever heard. Shocked, 
the men on both sides stopped fighting for 10 minutes. When the battle was over, Nelson declared, Victory is not a name strong enough for such a scene. It was the most decisive battle in naval history, Napoleon's Pearl Harbor. Nelson was a Navy man and had no intention of fighting on land. He had destroyed Bonaparte's warships and it would be difficult for the French to get supplies or reinforcements from France. He dryly commented, their army is in a scrape and will not get out of it. And he sailed away, leaving the French stranded in Egypt. Imagine Napoleon's situation. His fleet is destroyed. He's stranded. He can't get supplies or troops from France. It's a military disaster. What's he going to do? He founds a scientific institute here. This is no ordinary soldier. This is a general with incredible drive and intellectual ability. Napoleon's Institute was made up of scientists, scholars and artists whom he brought with him to study every aspect of Egypt. One of my favorites was Vivant Denon, the artist who helped Bonaparte bring Italian art back to France during the Italian campaign. At 55, Denon was one of the oldest members of the Egyptian campaign, but was quite happy to sketch the temples as bullets whizzed by his head. Then there was General Caffarelli, who led the engineering corps. He had lost a leg fighting in Germany and scurried about on a wooden one. Bonaparte really liked his spirit and took Caffarelli with him wherever he went. At the first session of the Institute, Bonaparte, the vice president, suggested research topics for the scientists, such as, how can the bread be improved? He is a Frenchman. Are the raw materials for gunpowder available in Egypt? He is a soldier. How can we improve the legal system of Egypt? He's a thinker, too. The scientists were free to investigate topics of their own, and even the most timid was more eager to explore the pyramids than to study bread ovens. With the institute formed, Bonaparte was now ready for his tour of the pyramids. And like every other tourist, he was probably shown a mummy. When Bonaparte visited the pyramids, he must have been really impressed. Remember, the Great Pyramid was twice as tall as any building in France. Until the Eiffel Tower, it was the tallest building on Earth. Napoleon urged some of his soldiers to climb the Great Pyramid, but he remained at the base. He had a sharp mathematical mind and calculated that there were enough stones in the three large pyramids to build a wall nine feet high and three feet thick around France. Then, accompanied by religious leaders of Cairo, he entered the Great Pyramid. They came in through an entrance made by tomb robbers centuries before them. Napoleon climbed up through this passage into the Grand Gallery. It would have been lit by torches. As he climbed higher and higher, he must have wondered what he was going to see. Then he entered the burial chamber of the pharaoh. When Bonaparte came in here with his entourage, it looked pretty much like today. Just a stone sarcophagus. The rest had been robbed thousands of years ago. Then he did the unexpected. He asked to be left alone in the king's chamber. We don't know for sure what happened in here when Bonaparte was by himself. But as he was leaving, one of his officers noticed he was a little pale and asked him if anything strange happened. Bonaparte told him never to mention it again. Towards the end of his life, Napoleon was about to tell someone what had happened. But then he changed his mind. He said, no, never mind. You wouldn't believe it. Maybe he saw Alexander the Great. Great men are supposed to have visions. And Bonaparte was never afraid to dream the big dream. <laughs> 
While Bonaparte dreamed of building an empire in the East, back in Paris, he had real problems. A scandal was about to break that would plague him for the rest of his life. Before leaving France for Egypt, Napoleon had married Josephine, an older widow with a scandalous reputation. As soon as he was away in Egypt, Josephine began living up to her reputation for excess and self-indulgence. She spent her husband's money as if there was no end to it, and bought Malmaison, a chateau on the outskirts of Paris, which she lavishly furnished. She was indiscreet, running around Paris with a series of stylish young men. People began to talk. Napoleon chose to ignore the letters telling him of her infidelities and to dismiss the obvious. Napoleon really understood men. He could get them to do anything for him. But when it came to women, he didn't have a clue. Anyone who did wouldn't have married Josephine. But finally, Bonaparte was forced to accept the reality of Josephine's infidelities. Distressed by the knowledge of Josephine's trysts, Napoleon soon found solace in the arms of Pauline Fouré, the 20-year-old wife of one of his lieutenants. Lieutenant Fouré was quickly sent on a fool's errand to Paris, and Pauline moved into a mansion next to Napoleon's. While the affair flourished, the Scientific Institute began their study of Egypt. The artist Denon was overwhelmed by the sight of the Sphinx and wrote, Although its proportions are colossal, those contours which have been preserved are supple as they are pure. The expression on the face is gentle, graceful, and serene. The mouth, with its thick lip, has sensuality in its sweep and refinement of the execution that are truly admirable. It is living flesh. Denon wanted to see the rest of Egypt, so he accompanied the French army, pursuing the Mamelukes in the south. He would be the first to sketch the southern monuments from Egypt's ancient past. He would have a chance to wonder at the great temples, at Karnak and Luxor, sketch the mysterious carvings in the Valley of the Kings, gaze on the Colossi of Memnon. He would record it all. His only fear was that he might not have enough time and materials. He did in fact run out of pencils and solved the problem by melting lead bullets and improvising. We still call them lead pencils today. Overwhelmed by the antiquities of Egypt, Denon was constantly asking the soldiers for more time to draw the temples and tombs. He was the first professional artist to enter the Valley of the Kings, the legendary burial place of Egypt's pharaohs. Denon had never seen such a landscape. An isolated valley, gleaming white in the sun, totally devoid of life, and carved into the sides of the valley were what looked like caves half clogged with debris. Inside were the tombs of the kings. He was desperate to record the tomb paintings with their vibrant colors. How was it possible to leave such precious curiosities without taking a drawing of them? How to return without a sketch to show? I earnestly demanded a quarter of an hour. I was allowed 20 minutes. One person held a taper to every object that I pointed out to him and I completed my task with spirit and correctness. Denon wasn't the only scientist working in the Valley of the Kings. Two of the youngest members of the Institute, René Devoyer and Prosper Jolois, were having the time of their lives. By the time the pharaohs were being buried here, the pyramids were a thousand years old ancient monuments. So the kings of Egypt selected a spot topped by a natural pyramid to look over their tombs. The two young engineers, in high spirits and seeking adventure, climbed out of the Valley of the Kings into a second valley that held no known tombs. They discovered one. After scrambling through descending passages, they came to a deep shaft designed to protect the tomb by catching water from the occasional rainfall. 
There they came face to face with the owner of the tomb. But they had no idea who he was. You see, it would be another 20 years before anyone would decipher the hieroglyphs and read the names. Our young friends had discovered the tomb of Amenhotep III, one of the greatest kings of Egypt. This was the king who built some of Egypt's grandest monuments. They also didn't know that Amenhotep ruled for 38 years, plenty of time to build a huge tomb. So they explored the pillared halls, mysterious side chambers, and magical spells on the walls. Finally, in the burial chamber, they found the king's broken sarcophagus. But Amenhotep wasn't there. Ancient tomb robbers had gotten to him thousands of years before. After the young scientists, two centuries of scholars would follow. They would discover incredible treasures in the Valley of the Kings. Mummies of the pharaohs, the gold of Tutankhamun, but Napoleon would never see the valley. A revolt had broken out in Cairo, and he was fighting for his life. The Cairo coffee houses, just as today, were where Egyptians gathered to smoke and drink strong Turkish coffee. Don't ask for latte here. The talk was inevitably of politics and the French invasion, but the whispers were of revolt. Bonaparte's hold on the city was slipping. All along, Bonaparte tried to convince the Egyptians that he was really a fellow Muslim, their friend and liberator. They never really believed him. Besides, he was taxing them to death to support his army. There were other problems too. An Arab writer of the time noted, the presence of the French in Cairo was intolerable especially when the Egyptians saw their wives and daughters walking the streets unveiled and appearing to be the property of the French, with whom they were seen in public and with whom they cohabited. Before these facts, Muslims died of shame. The makings of a revolt were beginning to bubble. From their pulpits, the religious leaders of Cairo preached against the French infidels, and on October 21st, all hell broke loose. One of the religious leaders cried, Let all those who believe there is but one God take themselves to the Mosque of Al-Azhar. Today is the day we fight the infidel. By six in the morning, faithful Muslims were running through the crowded Cairo streets with sticks and muskets. Soon, small groups of French soldiers were attacked, and General Dupuy, the commandant of Cairo, was killed. Bonaparte raged from his headquarters and ordered the cannons of the citadel to be aimed at Al-Azhar Mosque and anything else near it. The assault lasted 12 hours. One Arab account says this bombardment was so terrible that people ran into the streets to hide in holes. Finally, the Egyptian rebels hiding in the mosques surrendered. To this day, you can see the scars of the bombardment. This is where Napoleon really blew it. His soldiers entered this mosque on horseback. This is outrageous. You don't even enter a mosque with shoes on. No supporter of Islam would ever permit that. The revolt of Cairo may have been over, but so was any chance Bonaparte had of Muslim support. When the sheikhs came to Bonaparte the next day, he appeared to be forgiving. He even commissioned a painting of him pardoning the leaders. I know many of you have been weak, but I would like to believe none of you is guilty. But when the sheikhs left, Napoleon ordered all those who had taken up arms against him be rounded up and taken to the army's headquarters in the citadel. There, secretly, in the middle of the night, the rebels were beheaded and their bodies were thrown into the Nile.
Napoleon was learning how to behave like a Middle Eastern dictator. Bonaparte had been in Egypt a mere four months, but a lot had happened. He had defeated the Mamluks, established a scientific institute, lost an entire naval fleet, crushed a revolt, and discovered that his wife Josephine was unfaithful to him. Now he faced another problem. The Turks were massing troops in the Holy Land. So Bonaparte decided to march out and destroy them before they became a real threat to him. His army passed through village after village with no resistance. And then they reached Jaffa, today a suburb of Tel Aviv. Within the walled city, 3,000 Turkish troops combined with the citizens to resist. Bonaparte bombarded the city with everything he had. Finally, he sent emissaries to arrange the conditions of surrender. But the Turks killed them and displayed their heads on the ramparts. When the French troops finally took the city, they went berserk. Bonaparte noted in his journal, the soldier's fury was at its height. Everybody was put to the sword. Being sacked, the town experienced all the horrors of a city taken by storm. The massacre was terrible. Soldiers became beasts, sinking their bayonets into old men and babies, raping young girls still locked in the arms of their dead mothers, while the cries for mercy from the sick and elderly filled the air. But this was only the beginning. This beach wasn't always the scene of family fun and swimming. When Napoleon was here, 3,000 Turkish troops, given assurances by Bonaparte's officers that they would be treated as prisoners of war, surrendered. When Bonaparte saw his officers return with several thousand prisoners in tow, he asked, what am I to do with them? To escort the prisoners back to Cairo would take too many soldiers. To keep them with the army was too cumbersome. To feed them, impossible. To set them free, unthinkable. Something horrible happened here 200 years ago. Napoleon had the 3,000 Turkish prisoners killed. They were marched to this beach, the French opened fire. Pretty soon the sea was red with their blood. And then the French were told to use their bayonets to save ammunition. This massacre could never have happened in Europe. But Napoleon wasn't in Europe. And he was behaving like a Middle Eastern despot. You know, it took three days to kill all those Turkish prisoners. Even Turks who swam out to distant rocks were hunted down and bayoneted to save bullets. Bonaparte would need all the ammunition he had. His problems were only beginning. When Napoleon entered the Holy Land, the plague was raging and dozens of his men were dying every day. To ease the suffering of his troops, Napoleon opened a hospital in Jaffa that was soon overflowing with victims. Everyone was terrified of the plague. For centuries, the disease had decimated entire countries. It seemed to come from nowhere, and no one knew its cause. What people did know was that it was a horrible death that began with fever and huge pustules covering the entire body. As the fever raged, the victims' tongues would swell, and their thirst became unbearable. The plague was killing dozens of men every day, but even worse than the loss of men, it was demoralizing Napoleon's army. Soldiers were afraid to assist their stricken comrades. Bonaparte had to stop the panic. So he declares that fear is the cause of the plague and courage the cure. Not very sound medical advice, but he's willing to back it up. So he comes here to this plague hospital. He talks to the patients and then, master of the grand gesture, he shocks everyone. Lying at his feet is a hideous corpse. The soldier's uniform is stained by burst pustules. What does he do? He kneels down here, picks up the dead man, carries him to a more dignified resting place, and places him down. Say what you will about Bonaparte. He wasn't afraid. That's why his armies would do anything for him. Later, Bonaparte would have this event immortalized in a painting where the dead soldier is shown as alive, and the hospital appeared far grander than it really was.
better for the legend. As horrible as it was, the plague was not the fiercest of Bonaparte's opponents. That was yet to come. When Napoleon's army reached the city of Acre, they faced one of the cruelest tyrants in the Holy Land, Jezer Pasha. Jezer was called the Butcher because most of his servants were missing an ear or an eye, the punishment for making a mistake. Jezer's fort, which defended the city of Acre, was almost perfectly situated, with only one heavily fortified side facing the land. That was a crucial point in the battle to follow. You see, there are two basic tactics if the enemy is protected in a fort. A. Set up your camp around the fort and starve him out. B. Storm the fort. But Bonaparte couldn't starve him out. The enemy English fleet sailed up to the fort and supplied Jezer Pasha with all the provisions he needed. That leaves plan B. Storm the fort. But there was a problem here, too. The fort was very well protected with some of the newest and largest cannon in the whole Middle East. Napoleon had lost all his heavy artillery to the British Navy. And to attack a fort like this, without heavy weapons on your side, is military suicide. Any other general would have given up. So what did Napoleon do? He attacked the fort. Like I've said, he's 29 years old, and he's never lost a major battle. But the assault would be extremely difficult. The British had placed cannons on a small island just offshore to protect the fort's most vulnerable area, the city's main gate. Napoleon's one-legged Caffarelli realized they would have to attack the area of the fort furthest away from the British gunships. So he chose to attack a corner tower. Once it was breached, the French could storm the fort. But to get to it, they would have to cross a moat. Caffarelli stomped around supervising the operation. The French were camped a quarter of a mile from the moat. So an engineer was sent to scout it. But he was killed by a sniper. So Bonaparte didn't have the details of its depth and construction. All they could see was a gradual slope from the top towards the bottom. When the men finally charged, they discovered the slope into the moat ended abruptly and was followed by a sheer drop of 20 feet. The French frantically tried to construct ladders to climb into the moat and then scale the other side. But it was impossible. As Jezer's men fired on them, the moat became a death trap. Napoleon hated sieges because troops were forced to attack one small area. He liked battles involving open troop movements, where his genius as a strategist could come into play. This was not his game. Now Bonaparte was running out of ammunition. So he printed a special order of the day, encouraging his men to sneak onto the battlefield and retrieve cannonballs. Each man was paid according to the size of the cannonball he brought back. Some enterprising soldiers built a mock fortification on the beach, hoping Jezer or the British would fire some large ones at it, because it was easier to dig cannonballs out of the sand. And they were paid twice as much for the big ones. The soldiers could certainly use the extra money. They hadn't seen their regular pay in months. In spite of Bonaparte's efforts, Acre wouldn't fall and the word arrived that more Turkish troops were preparing to invade Egypt. Napoleon had to fold his tent and sneak out in the middle of the night. He had just experienced his first major defeat in battle. But you would never know it from the message he sent back to Cairo. I have razed Jezer's palace and the ramparts of Acre, and I have bombarded the city in such a manner that not one stone remains in place. Now that's damage control. You can still see the fort standing on the Israeli coast today. But the one thing he couldn't disguise were his losses. Bonaparte's favorite, one-legged Caffarelli, had his arm shattered by a cannonball 
and died 18 days later. He's buried here. Caffarelli's in there. It's minus a leg and an arm. But that's not all he's missing. Bonaparte had his friend's heart removed and mummified so he could bring it back to France with him. That's the kind of thing that made him a legend. Who would think of doing something like that? As I said before, this is no ordinary general. As the army marched back to Cairo, Bonaparte was faced with difficult decisions. Many of his men, too sick to be moved, had to be left behind. Those who could travel were carried on horses and camels. But the animals were also needed to pull the field guns, and Napoleon didn't have nearly enough. When they reached the city of Tantura, 22 cannons were dumped into the sea, freeing more horses and camels to carry the wounded. The surgeon Larray devised a camel ambulance. Bonaparte walked. As the men marched back through Jaffa, where Bonaparte had massacred the Turkish soldiers, he had yet more tough decisions. His soldiers in the plague hospital were too sick to be moved, and the Turks were closing in. Today, the picturesque Armenian monastery that once housed so much suffering is in sad decay. But standing here, one can imagine the screams of delirious men awaiting death. And in these rooms, a moral drama played out 200 years ago. Bonaparte ordered the remaining French plague patients to be poisoned rather than leave them to be tortured by Jezier's men. The poison was administered by the army's chief pharmacist, who deliberately gave the patients a small dose and some recovered to tell the tale. Later, Bonaparte insisted that the poison was left at the patients' bedsides so they could take it voluntarily in order to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy. When Bonaparte finally neared Cairo, he called a halt. He had a plan. The wounded were left in villages outside the city. The healthy were formed into ranks, captured flags were carried in the front, and a band played, and the army entered Cairo triumphantly through the Bab el Nasser, the gate of victory. Not only did he enter through the gate of victory, he renamed its towers after his countrymen. You can still see the inscriptions. Bonaparte was a hero. At least that was his version. In his heart, he knew the Egyptian campaign was lost, but he was far from finished. Napoleon realized his Egyptian campaign was lost. He had been soundly defeated at Acre, was losing hundreds of men every day to the plague, and had no way of getting reinforcements. Well, if his glory didn't lie in Egypt, perhaps it awaited him back in Europe. He summoned his next in command, General Kleber, to the fort at Rosetta. But it was an appointment Bonaparte had no intention of keeping. As Kleber made his way to the fort, Napoleon was miles away on the Alexandria coast, boarding a ship. He was about to leave Egypt forever. He didn't tell Pauline, his mistress. He didn't tell the army. He didn't even tell his next in command, General Kleber. I don't think he wanted to see him face to face. Instead, he left him a packet containing this letter. It's got some really interesting insights into Bonaparte. Look over here. He talks about how the news of Europe is forcing him to leave for France. And down here he says, it hurts me to leave my soldiers to whom I'm so attached but it'll only be temporary. Lots of luck. Poor Kleber. He's in charge of an army that's decimated by the plague. No hope of reinforcements. And it's worse. Bonaparte tells him to collect taxes, continue military victories. You know, Bonaparte's done it again. He's putting a very positive spin on his own military disaster. The spin worked. When Bonaparte returned to Paris, it was not as a defeated general who had just abandoned the decimated army. It was as a hero. He immediately had medals struck, showing himself as the liberator of Egypt. He was commemorating victories that never happened. One medal even showed him entering Egypt like a Roman emperor in a chariot pulled by a pair of camels. That's chutzpah. He had lost half his army, but everyone believed him. <laughs> 
Within weeks, he was ruler of France. Well, as I said before, Napoleon knew how to spin his own legend, but he sure didn't know much about women. When he returned from Egypt, the unfaithful Josephine tearfully convinced him to return to her. And he did. But he didn't just return to Josephine. He returned to a stack of unpaid bills for this place, the love nest she had bought while he was in Egypt. And it wasn't just the building he was paying for. She was furnishing it lavishly, expensively. Bonaparte may have been unhappy about the bills he had to pay, but let me tell you, it's a great place to run a country from. Our story doesn't end here. The lives of many were changed by his dreams of glory. The general he left in charge, Kleber, was assassinated in Cairo less than a year later. The army continued to be decimated by the plague and finally surrendered in 1801 to the British. The survivors felt fortunate to have escaped with their lives. The scientists? They continued to collect their antiquities, birds and plants until the day of surrender. When they learned that all of their drawings and collections were going to be confiscated, they said they would rather go to England with their specimens than return home to France without them. The British kindly let them keep everything. Well, almost everything. You see, some of the scholars spent their time copying hieroglyphic inscriptions, hoping it would lead to the decipherment of the ancient language. Then they got their break. As the soldiers were shoring up the foundations of the fort at Rosetta, they came upon ancient blocks inscribed with hieroglyphs. One, a large stone, bore the same inscription written in ancient Egyptian and Greek. They knew they had stumbled upon something very important. The British wouldn't let the French keep the Rosetta Stone and took it back to England, where you can still see it today in the British Museum. 20 years later, the French scholar Champollion, using the Rosetta Stone, cracked the code and read Egyptian hieroglyphs for the first time in 2,000 years. So the deciphering of hieroglyphs came out of Napoleon's quest for glory. It was the beginning of modern Egyptology, perhaps Napoleon's greatest legacy. And Napoleon? Well, if you remember your history, he eventually crowned himself emperor. But in the end, his impatience and overconfidence did him in. As in the Egyptian campaign, Bonaparte invaded Russia unprepared for the weather, this time freezing winter conditions. He lost more than a quarter of a million men. It was in Egypt that Napoleon first tasted absolute power. In the shadow of the pyramids, he realized he could inspire men to almost superhuman deeds. It was in Egypt that a young general named Bonaparte became Napoleon the Great. After his final defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon died in exile, but always wanted to be buried in France. Twenty years later, he finally got his wish. When the body was returned to Paris, it was the dead of winter, the temperature below zero. Napoleon's body moved through the streets in a gilded temple-shaped hearse draped in purple and gold. Old soldiers, veterans of Waterloo, Russia, and the Egyptian campaign lined the streets in ill-fitting, tattered uniforms to salute their emperor one last time. 36,000 official passes were distributed for the funeral, but so great was his legend that more than a quarter of a million requests were made. In spite of all his failings, Napoleon Bonaparte was a great man, a visionary who saw no limits, and his men were proud to have been part of his vision. So he lies here, under a great dome. His epitaph? Let him rest in peace beneath this dome. It is a helmet for a giant's head.